Hello everyone, my name is Dave Landry. In the following webinar, you're going to hear some references to an IPO webinar, and that's because this webinar was originally recorded as a prequel to my IPO webinar for those who are either newer to trading or are due to my methodology. We were happy with how the recordings came out, so we decided to make them available as a gift to a wider audience. So I hope you enjoy them. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email at dave at davelander.com. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I want to thank you for purchasing the IPO webinar and uh, attending this uh, Introduction to Trading Trends webinar here. We're going to cover the basics today, but you would be surprised how important it is to sometimes come back to the basics. And a lot of what I'm showing you here is actually really not that basic. So we're going to compress a lot of material down into a very short period of time. And by the end of this presentation, you should have a pretty good idea of how the methodology works, both good and bad. Now, there's a display on the screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. And the short version is all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I think most everyone here knows me. There are a few new faces. Um, I'm not going to bore you and go through all this. You can get a bio off my website. I've been doing this for about 20 years. And I've written three books that have uh, been published in seven different languages total. And what else is going on I want to tell you? I think that's enough. Now, if you're like me, you'd probably be more interested in the methodology than me. And I don't want to spend too much time on this because I've talked about it many times before, but there's a couple things I want to harp on. Uh, it's not my way or the highway. There's a lot of ways to trade. There's some ways that I'm not a big fan of, but if you use that methodology and you're successful with that methodology, then by all means, use that methodology. But if you can take something that I do and make your stuff better, that's that's even better. That's great, okay? So you don't have to follow everything I say, obviously. It's not my way or the highway. But if you could take something a la carte from me and make your trading better, that's fantastic. Not a get-rich-quick uh, scheme. There will be losses, but you win by surviving the bad times relatively unscathed. And I use the word relatively unscathed. There will be some drawdowns. There will be some losses. But you do great in the good times, and you catch a few winners here and there, and that makes it all worthwhile. And that's trend following 101, by the way. There is a repeatability in what I do, and every time I talk about this, I realize it's more and more and more and more important to talk about it. Um, you don't have to, just a regular generic brokerage will work. You don't need some high-end brokerage where you have to get the execution down to the penny or some offshore account in uh, Nigeria where they'll allow you to do some things that are pretty much illegal in the United States. Um, it's not that crucial. You could be, I hate to use the word sloppy, but you could be a little sloppy with your entries. I know some day traders that are in and out all day long. You try to follow them. It will become an exercise in futility. You would be getting in right as they're getting out, and your execution is going to be so crucial. If you're off by a penny or two, then you're not going to succeed. And, again, I don't want to dig myself a hole and pick a fight with any of these people because some of these people are successful at what they do. But the repeatability of it for the average Joe out there is very difficult, okay? I always get asked, by the way, does it work in all markets? Yes. Does it work in all time frames? Yes. But there is an efficiency issue, which we're going to talk about a little bit tomorrow in the IPO webinar. There's an efficiency issue where more efficient markets, it doesn't work as well. You have to pick your spots more carefully. For instance, if you're going to do Forex, you want to trade only off of major, major lows. And if you look at like the or commodities or something, if you look at like the the webinar I did just yesterday, in fact, it's on my website under free videos if you want to look at it when you get a chance. I talked about a major low in coffee, 
uh, off with a bow tie. Okay, so if all you did was trade those transitions off of major lows, so you have to pick your spots a lot more carefully in efficient markets. Efficient markets are markets that are well analyzed and well traded by a lot of people. Forex, okay, you're not going to wake up tomorrow and say, wow, there's this thing called Forex and I'm going to start trading. Well, you might be aware of it, but trust me, there's trillions of dollars being swapped around in that, and there's a lot of people fighting it out. Uh, that's the beauty of the IPOs. They're unbelievably inefficient. And again, we're going to get into that in a lot more detail tomorrow. It can be hard work, but for me, it's a lot of fun. Uh, the general, the core methodology, which we're going to work on today, I like to look at a couple thousand charts every night. For me, it's like being on a treasure hunt. I get a big cup of coffee, and it's a lot of fun. And the goal is to minimize losses and allow for the occasional home runs. And that outlier or those home runs are very important, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Now. I'm going to go way back to the most basic of basics. But guess what? This is so important because people confuse the issue with facts so many times, okay, so much, so often. The question is, what is a stock? And here we have a little piece of paper for Big Dave Corporation, okay? This is 100 shares, okay? So what is a stock? A stock is a piece of paper. Well, it used to be a piece of paper. Now it's an electronic blip in your account. But a stock is a piece of paper, or used to be a piece of paper, that represents ownership in a company. Okay, You own a little piece of that company as represented by the paper. Now, what is a company? Okay, Well, a company is a person, partnership, or corporation engaged in commerce, manufacturing, or service. It is a profit-seeking enterprise or concern based on, that's what dictionary.com says. Now again, a stock is a piece of paper representing ownership in a company. Okay, I've got some stock certificates on my wall. I bought a whole bunch of them. They're cheap. And they make for great decorations, by the way. And I take the prettier ones, the one with the pretty ladies and, and some pretty gentlemen. <laughs> More pretty ladies and gentlemen, though. Or interesting graphics or interesting companies like Studebaker because I, like, um, I like cars. So I've got Studebaker stock and just a variety of different um, and quirky companies and all. I've got them on, on the walls uh, of my office, uh, on one wall at least. So that's a piece of paper uh, representing ownership in a company. Now, a company is an entity looking to prosper through commerce and those other things that I said earlier. Now, here's the clincher, and I know you guys' eyes are ro rolling over right now or glazing over, but you're going to be surprised how many people confuse this concept. A company is not a stock, okay? And a stock is not a company. But people get that confused okay there he, a company might be doing great things and going great places but if the stock price doesn't reflect that then you shouldn't be in that stock a stock a company might be selling some promise and they might not materialize but if the stock is going up that's a good thing and that's the promise of the future. And that's what makes the IPOs work so great. They're a bit of a technician's dream because they often go up in spite of what the company may or may not be doing. So don't confuse the two things, okay? Just because you like your iPhone, don't run out and buy Apple. So why does a stock exist for you? Okay, not for a company. Uh, for a company, a stock exists so they can monetize the company's currency. It's one way of looking at it. Um, people come public maybe to get uh, to pay off their employees, to maybe pay down some debt, to maybe get some money in to create a cure for drugs, to expand their burrito business or whatever. But why does a stock exist for you? A stock only exists for you for one reason and never ever forget it. The only reason a stock exists from your perspective is for you to make money. Why would you ever buy a stock 
unless you intended to make money on that stock. Okay? So don't confuse the issue with facts. A stock is a stock. A company is a company. Now, why technical analysis? Well, there are no hard and fast rules when it comes to fundamental analysis. A company can have great earnings for years and years and years and years, and the company can actually go down. Why? Well, probably, and this is just a guess, but probably because those earnings were discounted, meaning that the excitement of those future earnings was discounted in the market, so the stock price ran up in anticipation of that. And then the reality over the next one, two, three, four, five, even ten years of good earnings could have already been priced in the stock. So keep in mind that the stock and the price of the stock is a much different thing than the company. So why technical analysis? Well, here's the beauty of technical analysis. There's a hard and fast rule when it comes to charts. There's a hard and fast rule with technical analysis, and I'm going to use those two words intertwine, or um, what, what, what am I looking for? <laughs> I'm going to use those, uh, I'm going to interchange those two words, charts and technical analysis. But here's the thing, there's only one hard and fast rule when it comes to technical, I'm sorry, there's only one rule that's a concrete rule that you cannot dispute. You can dispute any rules in fundamentals. You can't say that if earnings go up 20% a quarter, quarter, the stock will go up guaranteed. There are no such guarantees. But a technical analysis, if a stock should go from A to C, and C is greater than A, and B is greater than A, it's going to have to, and C is greater than B, it's going to have to have to pass through B on its way to C. So if it's at $5 a share and it's going to $20 a share, well, guess what? It's going to have to pass through B along the way. Now, it's not quite as simple as buy at B, although in IPOs it might be. And tomorrow I'm going to show you what I call the buy at B pattern, not to tease you or anything. But I think that's, that's important to know that a market is going to have to pass through B if it's going to C, okay? And, well, we'll get into that tomorrow. So now we know that the reason we use technical analysis is that market's going to have to go through a higher price if it's going to an even higher price or a lower price if it's going to even lower prices for shorts. So the question is, why do you want a trend follower? Well, even if you're a contra-trend player, you have to be a trend follower for at least some length of time. Otherwise, you would not get paid. So my point is, why not be a trend follower all the time? So if you buy a market at A, in order to profit, another big duh, you have to sell higher than you buy. So if you sell it at B, well, your profit is going to be B minus A. And then from A to B is a trend, okay? So you have to capture a trend. If you're going to have a successful trade, you have to, you must capture a trend. If you sell short, your profit's going to be A minus B, and A to B, as you can see, is a trend. Okay. Now, I have a very simple approach. As you can see from the following chart, it's pretty easy. Okay, that's a joke. <laughs> now, I keep things very simple, but the reason I'm showing you this, other than to hopefully uh, interject a slight amount of humor into this presentation, is that I get charts that look like this all the time, and people ask me my opinion, and it's like, well, is there an actual price chart underneath all this? Because I certainly can't see one. I think there's, I think I see something that looks like a bar. Maybe wait right there. I see something, but. People end up with analysis paralysis, and this is not what technical analysis is from my standpoint. Technical analysis is closer to that ABC chart or figure we looked at a minute ago. Now, the reason I show you that is because people overcomplicate things, and I do a whole presentation on this, and I've done it in the past. You can probably find it um, somewhere on my website, or, or I've done it for other people. But uh, if you have trouble finding it, let me know. It's definitely in the flash drives where... 
you, we all start with a blank chart. We get our chart, charting packages, provided there's no templates already set up for us, and we just start with a blank chart, and we start adding these indicators. And we tend to add more and more indicators, and we reach a point in our journey where we start studying the complex and the arcane, okay? We start maybe counting waves, um, counting, there's some number counting methods out there. There's some arcane stuff, okay? Some numerology, okay? And then at some point, this enlightenment begins to happen, this understanding. And this is not unlike any Eastern philosophy. There's a lot of Eastern philosophies that talk about how when you reach the beginning, you've come to true enlightenment. And it's very much true in a trading world. Once you start peeling away all of that fluff, and you get back to the blank chart is when true enlightenment, at least for many, begins to happen. Okay? So, all kidding aside, my approach is a very simple one. One should not increase beyond what is necessary, the number of entities required to explain anything. And I think Einstein has a very similar quote where it's things should not be as simple as possible but then no further. But basically, I think he's saying something very similar to Occam's razor. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci said it the best, I think, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Okay. And a lot of people think just because it's simple, it doesn't work. Uh, I know people that uh, have these very complex methodologies, and they tend to be seen as a guru because, they, because nobody can figure out what they're doing because it's so complex, and then they have this mystique about them. But my stuff is very simple. Somebody was asking me a couple of days ago, what's, what's your average client? It's like, well, I've got PhDs. I've got kids in high school. It's like I've got a, a, a mix of both and uh, some college kids too. Um, should you trade for short-term or longer-term gains? Well, Here's the thing, no matter what anyone tells you, especially if they're screaming and hollering on TV, you can only predict the short term when it comes to market. It's sort of like uh, predicting the weather. If it's cloudy and thundering outside, I know, and getting kind of dark, I know it's going to rain fairly soon, but I don't know if it's going to be raining this time next week or next year or 10 years from now. Well, trading is no different. As I said early on, kind of setting a few things up here, all predictions are about the future. A lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So in spite of what anyone tells you, you can only predict the short term. The great thing about the short term is your risks are better defined. Something bad can't really happen in general or something bad doesn't happen over a short period of time. I mean, it can, okay, and that's one of the dangers of day trading. Something bad still can happen. But you're less likely to have something bad happen to you if you're only in the market for a short period of time. Unfortunately, you just don't make enough money. The real money is in the longer-term trends. So let's talk about longer-term trading. Well, that's what the money is. Unfortunately, the longer you forecast, the less accurate you will be. And then you're going to have big losses and big drawdowns. We all read about these famous traders who make all this money, but what they often fail to tell you is that they subsequently blow up by taking on too much risk, trying to capture longer-term trends. Your accuracy is to be very low. Um, I hate to get into statistics because statistics is all worthless. 73.2% of people know that, okay? But when I did a lot of mechanical testing years ago, which helped me to become a discretionary trader, uh, you're going to be right about 28% in capturing those longer-term trends. So you're going to be right, I'm sorry, you could be wrong, roughly three quarters of the time. So what do, what's to do? It's a bit of a dilemma. Should you trade for short term or longer term gains? And the answer is yes. Why not trade for a small quick gain but be willing to stick with a position as long as it moves in your favor? This is a dated example but it's one of my favorites. It's a position that's set up really nice uh, 2009 after the bottom. Had a really good trend here, a little pullback. By the way, this is the same chart I showed earlier with all that fluff on it. And this thing, we were able to ride out a pretty decent trend in here for a couple of years. And, but we took partial profits within a few weeks right back here. It just took it a little bit off. And the reason you take a little bit off is because, again, you can only predict with any degree of accuracy the short term. When I got in this trade, I'm like, this thing looks pretty good. 
But did I know it would go a couple of years? No, I did not. So you could only predict the short term. But you could use a trailing stop, which I'll show you in a lot more detail in a few minutes, to keep you in that position for a long, long time. This one triggered right around here, and we got a nice little pop out of it within a – might have triggered a little bit over here, but – Within a few weeks, we've got a nice little pop out of it, better than poking out. I think it's about a 30% move. And then through trailing stops, you're able to ride out the longer-term trend. And that's where the real money is, okay? Here's another one. This is one of my favorite examples. Uh, we had a nice little accelerating trend, which I'm going to talk about in a minute or so. Had a nice little pop the first day, but it didn't do a whole lot, but eventually – it began to run. So you take some partial profits. I think we took profits right around here because we don't know. This is a big unknown, okay? And our trailing stop is going to keep us in the position, hopefully, for a long, long time, and hopefully that trend goes a long, long ways. Now, how do you predict the short term? Well, reversion to the mean is a fancy way of saying that, um, let's say you have an average it's how much something moves around the average, okay? Mean is interchangeable. That's the word I was looking for earlier, interchangeable, with the word average when it comes to statistics. And imagine a dog on the sidewalk, and I'm not sure where I first heard this analogy. It seems like it's been around forever, but um, if somebody knows where that comes from or a book, I'll give them credit because I don't want to not give credit. But anyway, you got a dog that kind of, let's say you walk on a dog, and it gets to one edge of the sidewalk, that little tug and the leash, okay, when it gets tight, it tends to meander back and forth. So that's a good way of illustrating reversion to the mean. Unfortunately, the real path, if any, to anyone's ever dog, walked a dog, is going to be a lot more erratic than this perfect little sine wave. So ideally, it's going to look like a little sine wave. And if it did, all you'd have to do is buy it oversold and sell it overbought. Unfortunately, every day I did that, metaphorically, that leash breaks. Markets get a little out of control and take off. Sometimes they stall well short of oversold uh, or overbought. So that ride could be a lot more bumpier. So ideally, you want to be buying into a market that's oversold or selling a market that's overbought. But you want to combine the longer-term trend with that. So if you've got a solid uptrend in place, okay, and then that market becomes oversold, you know there's a pretty good chance it's going to pop back to overbought. And that's the basis of the methodology. We're trading reversion to the mean in the direction of the trend. I'm not a big fan of reversion to the mean trading in and of itself because those people will tell you, well, if a market drops – 10%, you should buy it. What if it drops 15%? Well, you should buy even more. What if it drops 20%? Well, you should buy even more. Because eventually it's going to come back. It's going to bounce. Well, eventually it doesn't always happen. And a true reversion to the mean player does not use stops because they're looking to play that bounce. But I think if you did play reversion to the mean, you would definitely have to have stops. Otherwise, you'd have a very brilliant but brief career. Every now and then we'll get into a choppy market. The reversion to the mean guys will, will float up or whatever you want to call it. Come out the woodwork. Float up would be a good way to put it, I guess. <laughs> and they look like geniuses. And then the market has a big spike down or accelerates higher, whatever the case may be, and it flushes them out of the system. Okay. So a very dangerous way to trade. But if you are trading with the direction of the longer term downtrend, and then you look to play that reversion to the bean move when the market becomes overbought for a downtrend and you sell short, there's a pretty good chance, provided that you did really good stock picking and the market's in your favor, overall market ideally in your favor, meaning going the same direction as your trade, sector moving the same direction as your trade. You've picked the best of the best setups, which we'll talk a little bit about in a few minutes. Then there's a good chance that you're going to capture that reversion to the mean move in the direction of the overall trend, meaning that pullback is going to rally at least initially, okay? So this move is fairly certain, and 
recently we've been in a drawdown and it's been pretty tough, okay? So it's it's not a given. I don't want to make it sound like it's a given, but earlier in the year when the market was really trending, it's like we had 9 out of 9 or 10 out of 9 or 9 out of 10, some ridiculous number where all the trades were working. Lately, not a whole lot of trades have been working out just so well. So it's fairly certain, but of course there's no guarantee. But it's fairly certain that you can get a reversion to the mean move in, in the direction of the trend. And this is certainly a lot more plausible than this. This has becomes really uncertain. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. But this is where the money is. If you could get a little profit here and then hang out just in case this materializes, you're going to do fantastic longer term. So here's the entire methodology in a nutshell. We want to first look for a strong trend, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. We're looking for a correction in that trend, a pullback, okay? And then we're looking to enter if and only if that position triggers. So if the market rallies and then dies out like this, we avoid a trade. By using a fairly liberal entry, one of my mistakes in, in the first book, because it was written, I got a little too um, egotistical, I guess. Um, I made it look like you could put that entry right above that high, okay? And I guess I probably have it drawn in a little too close right here, like you just entered right above this high. Uh, in reality, you want to give that a little room. That's lesson 102. But you want to give it a little bit of room just to avoid a false start. Nowadays, there's a lot of, um, I want to stop short of saying manipulation, but for lack of a better word, there's a little manipulation that seems to occur, and which can push these markets. It seems like they'll push them just past the prior high, and then they die. Okay. So you want to wait till you get an entry. Once you get an entry, guess what? You could be a wrong. You could be wrong on any trade. I don't care who you are. Okay, even the guy screaming and hollering on TV, he could be wrong, or she could be wrong on any given trade. So we put a stop in. If the trade works, we're going to on somewhat of a one-for-one -one basis. If it moves up, let's say it moves up 50 cents, we're going to bump our stop up 50 cents. Okay. It's going to be in somewhat lockstep manner. Now, tomorrow with the IPOs, I'm going to show you that we're going to be a little bit more liberal with the money management in general. We're going to treat them a little bit differently, but not too much differently than we do with the core methodology. But you want to trail that stop higher. And once you get your initial profit targets, you're up to break even on the trade. Okay, You bump your stop to break even. You take off half, and then you keep half of your trade for hopefully it turns into a longer-term trend. Now, is half enough? Yes, because if it turns into a massive longer-term trend, you're going to make a lot of money even on half of the position. The people will argue way out here, okay, let's say this trend continues like this. People will argue way out here that half is not enough. You're only half on and you got a big old trend. Well, half is plenty, okay, because quite often you're not going to get this outlier move here. Quite often it might come right back in. Okay, so at least you took half your profits. At least you made something. I call that the better than the poke in the eye trade when it comes back in. Now, some people will say if the market's choppy and we're, we hit the profit target, it comes back in, and we hit the profit target, it comes back in, they state the obvious. Why did I take 100%? Well, if you take 100% of the profit target, and I've got a, a webinar out there that we talked just about that, you're going to end up with a negative expectancy, and that's where people think a lot of times that my money management has a negative expectancy. Because you're actually risking twice as much as you're making. Because you're only taking one for one on your stop. So if you're risking, let's say you're risking two, let's say you're risking, um, let's say five points, okay? Well, you're taking profits at five points. So you're only one for one on your initial profit target. But the way it works is you capture this additional, uh, this occasional 10 to 1 or 20 to 1 or 100 to 1, some big number out here. That's going to make your entire year on just one position or one or two positions, okay? So, again, you want to wait for an entry, trail that stop higher, take partial profits, get that stop up to break even when you're taking the partial profits. And then once this, or if this, I should say, begins to materialize, you kind of relax, ha-ha, I know, and you let this stop widen out. Now, longer term, this stop is going to look like a very long-term moving average. 
And a lot of people ask me that when they first see me draw the stop in on a chart. They're like, is that a moving average? And I'm like, no, that's actually me eyeballing the chart and determine, determining where my stop should be. Okay. So it all boils down to identifying a significant trend. I'm sorry, identifying a trend or a significant change in trend. Now, by change in trend, I mean a trend transition and emerging trend. And we're going to look at that in just one second. And then you want to enter that trend on a pullback. Money and position management are key. And then psychology is the ability to execute and follow that plan. This concludes part one. In part two, we're going to look at identifying trend with trend qualifiers, three phases of trend, and two of my favorite patterns to get aboard establish trends. Thank you. And again, if you have any questions, shoot them to dave at davelandry.com.